Welcome to Short Takes on Geography with Dr. Lisa Benton Short, Professor of Geography at the George Washington University and Chief Reader of Advanced Placement Human Geography. Join us as Dr. Short interviews Dr. Parag Khanna, geostrategist, world traveler, and best-selling author, discussing central concepts in the AP Human Geography curriculum through the lens of his new book, Move, The Forces Uprooting Us. This discussion series is brought to you by the American Geographical Society, the foremost champion of geography for the benefit of society since 1851. And now, over to Dr. Lisa Benton Short. Well, welcome geographers. Uh, it's so exciting to be here and to share with you some ideas about human geography and AP human geography in particular. My name is Lisa Benton Short and I am a professor of geography at George Washington University, which is just a few blocks from the White House here in Washington, DC. Um, I'm also the chief reader for AP Human Geography, and I'm thrilled to be able to present uh, a wonderful conversation that we're going to have over a series of, uh, of the units in AP Human Geography. Um, and I have a very special guest with me to talk about why human geography is more important than ever, and is Parag Khanna. Hi, Lisa. So good to see you. Thanks so much for inviting me to join you. And uh, I'm thrilled. I didn't get to take uh, human geography when I was in high school. It actually hadn't been created yet as an AP subject. Uh, but, uh, but we can always live in through the youth uh, of today. So I'm really excited for this. Um, so I am a writer. I write books about geography and geopolitics and globalization. I consider myself a traveler. I've been to most of the countries of the world and, you know, sort of seen it firsthand. So I'm excited to see what lessons we can share with uh, today's AP Human Geography students. Absolutely. I mean, some of your work is just so cutting edge on the, on the changes that we're confronting in the 21st century. And so one of the things that we wanted to share with all APHG students is just how important a geographic perspective can be in understanding some of these really critical um, issues and challenges that we're faced with. So we're gonna begin uh, at the beginning of AP Human Geography by thinking geographically, which is the theme of unit one. And you know, one of the things that is true is that AP Human Geography has been one of the fastest growing AP subjects. And I think it is because it both represents so many of the ways that we have to look at the world and understand the world, not only in the contemporary challenges that we face, but also in how these, the larger context for how some of these, these issues emerged. And um, so one of the things that we're gonna do is have some conversations about some of Parag's work and some of his thinking about some of the critical challenges that we're facing in the world today and why geography and a geographic perspective is so important in helping to better understand some of these. So Parag, what does geography mean to you? Oh, what a big and great question to start on, Lisa. And I have to say, you know, all of the students in AP Human Geography today are so lucky because it has become such a comprehensive science and an exciting area of investigation. And quite frankly, in the early 1990s, it was just earth science in pretty faded old textbooks. Uh, so I think, you know, everyone who is studying it today is very lucky uh, to capture this time where technology plays such an important role, for example. And I know we're going to talk more about that. But let me step back for a moment because, you know, when we say geography still, for so many people, it is only that uh, environmental layer. The way I think about geography to humanize it is to bring us in and the things that we have built in to the geographic picture. So let me explain with a couple of maps here. I think that we that there are four geographies rather than just one geography. And the one that of course no one would dispute is natural geography, right? Our planet as we found it, as we inhabit it, you know, in which you have brown for the deserts, green for the forests, blue for the oceans, right? No disagreement about that. And that is perhaps you could say uh, almost inarguably the most important layer of geography. But now let's think about the world as we, as we use it, as we've shaped it. And that brings in the second geography, the second layer, which is of course our political geography. And this is the map that hangs in most classrooms and offices around the world. It shows us right away, first and foremost, no longer the natural geography, it shows us our political geography, it shows us our borders, it shows us our capitals, it shows us 
And I don't think that this is a very sort of positive thing in some ways. It shows us how we're divided from each other. And it almost makes it seem natural that that is the way the world is organized according to division. And therefore, I'm a strong believer in the third layer of geography as well, functional geography, which is of course the things that we have built. And most of what we have built actually connects us across those boundaries. It connects people to each other in cities, within countries or across cities. And here, what looks like a very colorful spaghetti bowl is actually a real depiction of the world, at least uh, for you know, Europe, Africa, and Asia, um, highways, railways, electricity grids, oil and gas pipelines, fiber optic internet cables, all of this we, humanity, have been building for much of the last century. And this is how we use the world. This is how we transcend natural geography and political geography. So that's the third layer. And the fourth layer of geography, of course, is us. It is human geography. It is the distribution of people across the world. Eight billion of us now, soon to be nine billion people. Where are we? And also deeper questions, you know, why are we there? Right. And what are what are the similarities and differences? So these are anthropological questions and ethnographic questions that we can ask when we talk about human geography. So when you ask Lisa, you know, what does geography mean to me? It means these four layers and the puzzle and the grand challenge is how do we actually reconcile them? Right. And so I'm thinking, how do we take these four different geographies um, understand what they're communicating, and yet also kind of synthesize them, integrate them, bring them together in our understanding of the world. So is there something that kind of gets at that, like maybe something like a climate model? Does that kind of help bring these physical and human and functional and political geographies more, make them more aligned? It helps to think in terms of, you know, going back to one aspect of natural geography that I didn't emphasize is the geology in a way. And in a way, a lot of our civilizational history and even the patterns of life that we either have you know, in common or that differentiate us can be looked at by continent, right? There are rhythms to life in South America that are different from Africa, that are different from North America, that are different from Europe, that are different from Asia, that are different from Australia, right? And so the geology does shape us pretty fundamentally. And what it does at least is to get us thinking beyond only that narrow political geographic layer, as if, the, as if our environment is different across boundaries. Because so often, of course, two countries that are next to each other have a very similar environment. So at a minimum, I advocate bringing in the natural geography into the political geography by thinking in terms of regions and continents. And in fact, as we'll continue to discuss, you know, most human migration has been within continental zones. And some of the, of course, inter-ethnic relationships and fusions have been within, you know, regional uh, zones. So I definitely think that the regional level is underappreciated. Sometimes we jump in geographic conversations from the national level to the global level. And we forget about that regional level. And in fact, in diplomacy too, that very often happens. So I would like to see students think in terms of, you know, local, uh, you know, uh, provincial, you might say, national, and then don't forget the regional before you talk about the global. I'm so glad you, you mentioned that because one of the most important skill sets that a geographer has is the ability to understand scale. And so we can take a concept like food insecurity and we can look at it at the local scale by say looking at food deserts in a city. We can look at food insecurity um, across a country and try and understand some of the reasons or causes for that then we can look at it regionally, which also might involve, you know, the bigger physical attributes of a region, such as climate and precipitation and soil types. Um, and so scale is such an important um, way in which we can link together some of these different geographies. So it becomes really complex, right? Because we're looking at different features on the, on the surface of the earth. We're looking at political boundaries and where people are living and, 
functional networks and, and connections. And we can go up and down scales too, from the very local all the way to the global. And that's a really important skill that geographers have that not many other social scientists bring to understanding some of the world's critical issues. So does that mean, Lisa, that we in geography are using technology better than other disciplines? Because the things that you describe, the phenomena that you just described, create a picture of a world that's so incredibly complicated. And so without GIS, you know, without the data we collect from satellites and, and, and the ability of the geographic profession to map those things so that we as a visual species can understand them, it would almost be impossible to grasp all of that complexity. So how about the role of GIS and technology? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, the main tool that geographers use, I guess, you know, humans are very visual, but geographers are really visual creatures. <laughs> and, and maps are essentially our way of conveying spatial distribution of whatever we're looking at, whether it's where people are, whether it is where um, the major cities of the world are, um, where it, it may be areas of conflict, or it even can be something like diffusion over time, like how did um, collegiate soccer spread from the East Coast of the United States to the West Coast? Maps are absolutely critical tools, and they're ones that we use a lot to try and both understand like the snapshot of the world today and also kind of the larger context of change over time. So yeah, I think, you know, GIS has given us um, some great new tools and so has open data and open street map really allowed people to contribute from their own communities to building a more comprehensive, detailed map of the world. It may surprise a lot of people uh, to realize that, you know, we have not mapped every place in the world. And even in the United States, there are communities that may not have all the buildings and all their roads and all their infrastructure well mapped. And I think GIS is a really powerful tool for that. What about social media, Parag? How's that influencing how we can create maps and better understand the world? Well, you gave one great example, you know, with OpenStreetMap. In a way, it is a crossover between, you know, mapping technology and social media because it's participatory. We not only get to, you know, say, this is my lemonade stand or this is my pizza shop, but we get to rank it and score it and, you know, label what time we were there and other people can tag it and say, I was there too and I love this place and I give it a five-star rating. So participatory geography, you know, is kind of what's emerging at the intersection of, um, of GIS and social media. And then of course, social media itself does allow us to transcend traditional geography. There is that phrase that you and I know from the 1990s that doesn't get used as much today, which is the death of distance, right? Does the fact that we are digitally connected and having this global conversation mean that distance is done? And I think we know the answer is no, it's not, right? We still live in a world of the exact same geographic proportions um, as, as we always have. But yes, we can at least communicate and share those geographic stories, right, and, and learn lessons across geography better. But as, uh, as you and I are going to be discussing, you know, the, the geographic contours and the impact of geography on us is still so incredibly and radically different um, across the world. Right. So I wanted to share with you one of my favorite maps that I always start my classes with and uh, get, your, get your reaction to this. So um, this is actually a 1650 map by Nicholas Sanson. And one of the what reasons that brings me such joy as a geographer is because it's wrong. Um, this is one of the most um, famous cartographic errors in history. Um, and I hope that uh, students who are watching this conversation have immediately found the big error and that is that California is shown as an island. So I actually was born and grew up in California and I can promise you it is not an island. Um, it may be a little wacky and out there, but um, it is definitely not an island. And um, I share this because it reminds us of the power of maps and the power to think geographically. Of course, this is the era of exploration and 
And, you know, we are mapping the world during this time period. And so, of course, we are creating errors. The interesting thing about this map is that California was an island on many world maps for the next 120, 130 years, even though um, people who are out exploring were not finding that this was an island, they still left it as an island on the map. And the reason why I like to share this is to remind everybody that you know, one of the most important tools for geographers are, is a map, right? I mean, we visualize complex data to show the spatial distribution of phenomena. Uh, we show change over time. We show these important contours of the world. Maps are stories about who we are, where we came from, and where we're going. And so they're really important tools that geographers use. But at the same time, we have to be really highly critical of the limitations of maps because they're in some ways products of their time and they're only going to be partial and selective representations of the reality of this planet. And so they're very prone to inaccuracy as this map shows. All of which means that if you're a student of AP human geography, you need to become both really adept at using maps, but also remain pretty skeptical of their limitations and potential problems. Um, so Parag, what do you think about the power of maps to both reveal the world, but also how do we, you know, how do we hold on to that caution that maybe the data is flawed or inaccurate? How do we kind of reconcile that? Oh, it's so well put, Lisa, because sometimes when I'm designing maps, you know, and making them, I, I want to cram so much there. It's like I have this quest to make the perfect map to capture every data point. And of course, it's not possible. And even if it were, once it's done, it wouldn't be decipherable. It would be such a, such a mess at some level. So one has to find that balance and, again, make layered maps, right, or maps of layers uh, so that we can zoom in on things that we really, you know, need to see and need to understand at any any given time. And of course, the data is always changing, which is so interesting as well. So like you say, one can't um, always trust, um, you know, what's on a given map, because it's limited by when it was created and where the information came from. And I do love your historical map as well. What, what I love about it is that it's incomplete. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in the 1650s, and you mentioned even 120, 130 years after that, in the late 1700s, California was still shown as an island. And let's remember that at that point in time, we still didn't have a complete picture of the North American continent. It had been settled for a couple of hundred years. We still have a complete picture of it or an accurate picture. Um, you know, the, uh, the westward expansion, the manifest destiny that happened in the mid 19th century. So now 200 years after this was created was really early, you know, mid middle of the way towards getting a, a more accurate picture of North America. So it has taken mankind all the way through for some parts of the world through the, um, you know, early mid 20th century to really get the full, complete, detailed map. You know, so right before computers were invented, we finally thought we had on paper an accurate depiction of the geography of the world on paper. And then came the digital revolution. And now we've been able to add layer upon layer upon layer of that. And that's, we're still early days in using all of this technology to create ever more uh, complex maps. And that, that is what is so exciting about human geography. Absolutely. I mean, it is the geographic perspective of using maps to understand some of these phenomena, but it's also this idea that our world is constantly changing. And even though we have a better image of North America now, it doesn't mean it's a complete image and that it's not continually changing. And I think that's the great thing about AP Human Geography is that it helps people to really develop that geographic ability to think spatially to think geographically. Um, and I think that's a great way for us to wrap up our first conversation about thinking geographically. So um, I invite you all to come back for our next video, which we're gonna look at unit two, population and migration patterns and processes. Thank you for joining us for this segment of Short Takes on Geography with Dr. Lisa Benton Short. Tune in for this and more great geography teaching resources at AmericanGeo.org. Until next time.